welcome to the Grim Curriculum. Here we are together in person once more. It's always so special when we get to see each other. It is, and it's always nice to hang out in person, and we're chilling. We're in the blanket fort currently in my little home office. It's very, very cozy, but we're not at summer yet, so we're not in here sweltering, and hopefully... Before summer, we'll be into our new space. Oh, I'd say definitely. We're so close. Yeah, much cooler for the recording in the summer, that's for sure. So I'm excited. The new studio, we got some furniture in there. You know, it's looking good. I'm excited. I've got like weird stuff I've started to collect to put on the walls and whatnot. I love it. Yeah, we're just missing some soundproofing and we're still doing a little bit of research on what kind of mics we're going to go with and that kind of thing. But yeah, it's all coming together, guys. Yeah. And speaking of coming together, we are on episode 99. Something special about 99. Of course, there's always something special about 100 or those big numbers. But 99 just has like, it's got a good vibe to it. It's our last uh, double digit number. I mean, really, that's big. It is. It is. And we have a pretty fun story for you. It's kind of got some folklore. It's kind of got some truth to it, as they all do. Yeah, this week we have a bit of a palate cleanser for you. Because as you probably know by now, we're going to be celebrating our 100th episode with a series that is going to be pretty damn gruesome. So for today's episode, we are going to be sharing with you the tale of the Pied Piper. Many of you may already be familiar with the story, or at least the fictional side of things. Like many fairy tales, this one was inspired by something that may have really happened. The real truth is still up for debate when it comes to this tale, but we're going to explore some theories regarding its origins. And if you think the story itself is grim, just wait until you hear where it may have come from. I love the idea of so many famous fairy tales that were read to us as kids having these sinister origin stories. They all seem to. Yeah, like when you think about it, they're all pretty bad to begin with. Like look at Hansel and Gretel being potentially cannibalized by a witch. Or Little Red Riding Hood's grandma being viciously eaten by a wolf and having her identity stolen. Like, this shit is dark. I mean, even if you think about the true, or rather the original story of The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. Yes. Incredibly sad and tragic. There is not a happy ending to that tale in the original tale. Sorry if I just spoiled your uh, day, Disney adults. (laughs) Um, But that being said... I always found, even when I read the tale of the Pied Piper as a kid or heard about it, it always struck me as quite sinister. I didn't particularly like it. The Pied Piper creeped me out. He's creepy. He's very creepy. And I mean, it's also not got a great ending. No, it does not have a happy ending at all. We're sure that most of you listening are familiar with the Pied Piper. However, we're going to give you all a quick little refresher. It was, of course, famously written about by the Brothers Grimm, but we have another version to share. This is one of many variations, but it's a personal favorite of mine. This is from the 1976 version by Robert Browning. And we will be including excerpts from his work. The story begins in the town of Hamlin, Germany, and is set in the year 1284. The town of Hamlin was known for its fine riches and wealthy population, However, they had a reputation for being very selfish. In fact, one of their favorite pastimes was apparently to sit there and count their gold, so much so that they began to resent their beloved pet cats and dogs because they had to spend their riches to feed them. That's a red flag. Big red flag. Incredibly, incredibly selfish. One day, they all decided to chase their furry friends out of town with brooms and sticks because not only would they save money not feeding them, they would free up their time for even more gold counting. It didn't take long until an abundance of rats began to enter the town, eating everything in sight and breeding and breeding until their numbers grew so much that they had chewed the walls of every house in Hamlin. The rats even attacked and killed the remaining animals in town. Robert Browning wrote... Rats. They fought the dogs and killed the cats, and bit the babies in the cradles, and ate the cheeses out the vats, and licked the soup from the cook's own ladles, spilt open the kegs of salted sprats, made nests inside men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning their speaking with shrieking and squeaking in fifty different sharps and flats. And fun fact where he says, split open the kegs of salted sprats. I'm pretty sure a sprat is a potato. 
Thank you. I was wondering about yeah, that. Yeah, I, I remember my dad. He hasn't said it much recently, but he would say, like, when he was a kid, sprats, which, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's potatoes. Thank you. Yeah. Look at us learning. So the folks of the town of Hamlin tried everything they could to deal with this sudden infestation, including the use of their strongest poisons. However, the rats continued to multiply. The town decided to hold a meeting to discuss their plans. It seemed that things were hopeless, until suddenly, a young man appeared. He was dressed in a strange coat that sported every color of the rainbow. He told them that he could get rid of all of the rats for a fee of 100 gold coins. And we want to share Browning's description of the man. And I quite like this myself, personally. It goes, His queer long coat from heel to head was half of yellow and half of red. He himself was tall and thin with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin, and light loose hair, yet swarthy skin, no tuft on cheek, no beard on chin, but lips where smiles went out and in. There was no guessing his kith and kin, and nobody could enough admire the tall man and his quaint attire. I love his writing. I like that they're like, yeah, we couldn't tell where he was from or who his family was, but he was wearing a snazzy jacket. Right, we like the look of him. <laughs> they agreed that they could pay him, but only if he could truly get the job done. He agreed to their terms and left while playing a strange tune that none of them had ever heard before. They looked out the window and saw all of the rats scampering towards him. As he walked through the town, they followed. Browning continues, Into the street the piper stepped, smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic slept, in his quiet pipe the while, then like a musical adept, to blow the pipe his lips he wrinkled, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled, and ere three shrill notes the pipe uttered, you heard as if an army muttered, and the muttering grew to a grumbling, and the grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the houses the rats came tumbling, great rats, small rats, lean rats, brawny rats, brown rats, black rats, gray rats, tawny rats, grave old plotters, and gay young friskers. Eventually he made his way towards the river and jumped in. The townsfolk were shocked to see all of the rats follow in after him. And one by one, they drowned. The piper got out of the river and made his way back to the chambers to collect his payment. When he arrived, he was greeted with cheers and excitement. He asked about his 100 gold coins and was shocked when he was offered the payment of only one. He argued and argued, but they wouldn't budge. Eventually, he left, but as he did, he swore he would get his revenge. He left the chambers, once again playing the same tune on his flute. The townsfolk could hear the sounds of tiny feet running towards him once again, but this time it was not rats, but their own children, who were happily making their way towards the piper. Their parents ran out begging for their return, but were completely ignored. The children were entranced by the music and continued to follow the piper. Browning said, There was a rustling that seemed like a bustling of merry crowds jostling at pitching and hustling. Small feet were pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little hands clapping and little tongues chattering. And like fowls in a farmyard where barley is scattering, out came the children running. All the little boys and girls, with rosy cheeks and flaxen curls, and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping, ran merrily after the wonderful music with shouting and laughter. The children were lured to a nearby mountain. The piper blew a high-pitched note on his flute, which caused a mysterious door to open out of nowhere beneath the rocks. They all entered the door and were never seen again. It is said that the children were taken to a new land that was filled with joy. They had everything they needed and were raised to be kind and loving. However, in other versions, the theories on what happened to them are much more tragic. As for the town of Hamlin, it grew silent without the sounds of children playing in the streets. Their parents were left behind, sad and alone. Browning finishes the poem by saying, Long time ago, in a mighty band, out of Hamlin town in Brunswick land, but how or why they don't understand. So will he let you and me be wipers of scores out with all men, especially pipers. 
and whether they pipe us free from rats or mice. If we've promised them aught, let us keep our promise. The lesson of the story was that if the parents had paid the piper and not been selfish, their children would still be with them. Like we said, this is one of the many versions of this story. However, the moral behind it remains the same. However, this is just a story, but there appears to be some truth behind it. For starters, the town of Hamelin itself displays some evidence that there may be more to this story. An old stone house sits in the town with a strange inscription on it that reads, A.D. 1284, on the 26th of June, the day of St. John and St. Paul, 130 children born in Hamelin were led out of the town by a piper wearing multicolored clothes. After passing Calvary near the Coppenberg, they disappeared forever. Hamlin Town Records from the year 1384 state, It is 100 years since our children left. We have more proof when we look into a medieval document called the Lunenburg Manuscript, which has been dated approximately from 1440 to 1450. It tells a similar story, but specifies that the children were lost near a place of execution. Locals also speak of a stained glass window that was destroyed in 1660. Records state that the window depicted an image of a tragedy involving children, as well as what appears to be a piper. While this doesn't fully confirm the story, it does suggest that something terrible happened to the children of Hamlin. But was their disappearance due to an act of revenge, or was it something else? We're going to explore some of those theories with you all today. And, fun fact, the street where all of this allegedly began is called <laughs> Bungalowsenstrasse, which translates to street without drums, and apparently there are very, very strict rules that apply to visitors, including not being allowed to play any music or drums. We may not know the full truth, but there are a lot of theories that actually make sense. For starters, we've talked about this a lot, but it was substantially easier to die during these times than it is now. We've spoken about the dangers of transportation, including children simply getting run over by wagons. It was a tough time to be a kid, and honestly, even an adult. And for those of you who don't know, we end every episode of our second show, Extra Credit, with a strange and unusual death segment. So, I mean, so far we've covered everything from stubbing your toe and dying to meeting an untimely end by slipping on an orange peel. So... I think it's fair to say we've seen our share of uh, weird deaths. Like the story states, the town was close to a river. It's possible that numerous children drowned in it, which is hinted when we hear about the Pied Piper leading the rats in. Speaking of the Pied Piper, it is quite possible that he was a real person, but that his motives were much more sinister. One potential reason a strange man would have wanted to lead children away, never to be seen or heard from again, is that he was simply a pedophile who stole the children away while they slept. The trauma suffered by the parents caused them to never speak the truth again, and instead concoct a story that was easier for them to live with. Yikes. No kidding, that one's pretty dark. Another theory is that a natural disaster happened, possibly a landslide. This is also seen in the story with the mountain opening up and taking them away. But let's take a second to talk a bit more about the rats. They're obviously a huge part of the story. There is actually no real record of the town having a rat problem. However, there are accounts of the Black Plague hitting the town in a very deadly way, which could account for the loss of life being reported. This particular theory leads us to believe that the Pied Piper was not an actual person, but a representation of death itself. This theory I like. Me too. I like this theory a lot. Mind you, the plague didn't arrive until around the 1300s, which does make it a little late for it to be the cause, but it is an interesting theory, and it would certainly explain the rat problem. Unless, of course, you've read the phenomenal book The Great Mortality by John Kelly, which proves that it was not rats who spread the plague, but most likely marmots or gerbils. So what's the theory we're thinking is the, the big one? It could possibly be something as simple as mass emigration, which certainly did happen around this time, or something that is known as the Children's Crusade. Okay, so let's start with this mass emigration. First of all, a large group of people could have absolutely relocated to another part of the country for one reason or another, 
But there is a theory, oh my God, a theory, but there is a theory that points towards something much more grim. And just going back to the emigration, something interesting is that there are certain towns kind of close to Hamlin that have a lot of the same last names that people from Hamlin had, which does actually show that people did emigrate in large quantities to different parts of the world there. So like a huge extended family would just be like, all right, we're moving, we're moving over. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Now back to the other theory. It's possible that the children were sent away by their own parents. You may be asking, why would parents send their own children away, never to be seen or heard from again? And the answer to that question, dear listeners, is poverty. Go figure. I mean, there are many stories of this happening throughout history. For example, during the Great Depression, children were sold or given away by their parents in hopes of giving them a better life or simply because there was not enough food to go around. Times were certainly tough and food could have been scarce, but was it bad enough for something like this to happen? This brings us to something called the Children's Crusade, which apparently all starts with a 12-year-old named Stephen and by other accounts, another kid named Nicholas. We need to preface this by saying that it's just like the story of the Pied Piper. There are varying accounts of the Children's Crusade. Not only that, but there are limited reports that have been verified, and much of what we think we know has been embellished throughout the years. Either way, we do know that this likely occurred sometime around the year 1212. It was a short-lived movement, and it lasted around five months. As reports show, the Children's Crusade was never actually approved by the church. It was an independent movement, and unlike other crusades, those involved didn't even have weapons. Instead, they carried crosses and banners as they made their way across Europe in an attempt to convert others to Christianity, and it's said that their numbers hit as high as 30,000 children. While Stephen is said to have been of French descent, Nicholas was German, which is likely how the story made its way into German folklore. This has often been attributed to a form of mass hysteria. As the thousands of children traveled along, they sang hymns, and at first it was an exciting and fun time. However, as months went on, they became hungry and tired, which ultimately led to the end of that crusade. Can I ask a question? You may or may not know the answer to this. So was this something that the kids just decided to do one day? What they said, actually, and I'm glad that you bring this up, is that they would have these recruiters come into towns. Uh... And the recruiters that would come into towns were also really young. Like they were, you know, around 12, 13, 14 years old. But another thing that they say in these reports is that the recruiters would dress in bright colors. Oh, I got it. Now, okay, I'm going to fully admit that this is a very short version of what happened during this alleged crusade. Religious history, it's not my forte. (laughs) I'm not going to lie, I have no desire to put us through an entire episode of it, which honestly we could do based on this. I think we're all going to agree on that. Oh yeah, that's fine by me. The dancing plague is also a potential motivator for this story, and we did mention that on Extra Credit quite some time ago, so definitely go back and check that out if you're interested. At the end of the day, we truly do not know if the Pied Piper was a real person or if he is a representation of something far more grim. What we do know is that this fairy tale is not as all as simple as it seems. In fact, it truly is surrounded by mystery. As it stands, we will likely never know the truth about what inspired the tale of the Pied Piper or what really happened to the children of Hamlin. I think, as always, it's probably a combination of everything, but... I do like the idea of of the Pied Piper being a metaphor for like the angel of death or death itself, if you will, like leading them away. Yeah. And I love the idea of the mountain opening up and taking the children away being a metaphor for uh, a landslide. That sounds like a terrible sentence I just said, but it's, it's a neat idea. I wonder if, like I said, if it was a combination of all things, maybe over the course of Because this seems to sort of pop up every couple hundred years where they mention it or whatever. You almost wonder if something is happening to the kids 
various different things, but each time it happens, it brings up the previous event, right? So it's like, oh, remember when we lost all the kids to the plague? Oh, remember when we lost them all drowning in the river? Oh, remember when there was that landslide? This happening all the time. And over time, it's just kind of mushed together to become this legend. And the thing to remember, too, is they didn't have all of the information that we have now. So it would make sense for them to turn it into this story that they would tell either as like a cautionary tale or as their own way of explaining something incredibly tragic that happened to them. Yeah, absolutely. If one thing is certain human beings love a good story and of a lot of our folklore does come from somewhere it does and a lot of it really does come from germany and when i was looking into this for the episode i found out that there is a fairy tale tour that you can take in germany Ooh. and hamlin is one of the sites that you visit but basically you go around germany and you visit all of these small towns where these stories happen to take place that's so cool i would love that i mean to even sort of be like Oh, yeah, this is the little house that inspired Hansel and Gretel. Yeah. Because, I mean, there's a lot of wacky stories that come out of the Black Forest, right? Because it's shrouded in mystery and people go missing and it's it's such a cool place. I love it. And for me, I oh, that would just be such an... I, Germany would be an amazing place to visit. I grew up with a lot of people... Uh, because I'm from Bosnia, when the war happened, a lot of people came straight to Canada. Mm -hmm. Some of us came to Slovenia like I did, but a lot of people came to Germany. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I grew up with a lot of friends who had just moved to Canada from there. And I saw all these pictures of these beautiful countrysides and these towns. And oh, it just seems like an amazing place to visit. I've been, but I was weeks old at the time. So I really couldn't tell you, you my memories. It? I don't, no, remember I don't remember anything, it. but I do know that I gave chicken pox to a bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> so do what you will with that information. But I would really love to go back again as an adult so I can really appreciate the full experience. I like how we just talked about all these like diseases being spread and stuff in the Pied Piper and then it was you. Yeah, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Mystery solved. I guess so. I was literally weeks old. We went back to Germany because my parents were stationed there, and uh, yeah, got chicken pox and like spread it to half the town. <laughs> Poor little thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I survived. I have a scar, but I survived. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> oh my god. Well, I hope you guys really like that story. We like kind of taking a deep dive into folklore and seeing the truth behind the story. And uh, yeah, I hope we brought that for you guys today. Everyone's heard of the Pied Piper of Hamelin, but I'm not sure that everyone has heard of the real theories behind it. Yeah, and I love the idea of fairy tales being a way to spread messages about how to behave and teach kids lessons in mm -hmm. a fun way. I personally, I really like the ones that scare you into behaving a bit. <laughs> like, I mean, this story here, it teaches the importance of being fair and paying people what they're worth. Yep. And it's, there's a lot to learn from it. There really is. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, pay your tradesmen or they'll lead your children to an untimely death. They'll do it. <laughs> Alrighty. So before we wrap up today, we just want to give a humongous thanks, of course, to our wonderful, splendiferous, gorgeous, stunning patrons over on Patreon. A huge thank you to Atlantean Jedi, Bob, Brian, Hillary, Judy, Kevinus Musicus, and Mayhem Mudkip. And like we mentioned recently, we have updated our Patreon a little bit. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. And of course, all of the proceeds from Patreon go towards improving the show, building our studio, and uh, just doing our thing. Yeah, absolutely. We appreciate the heck out of you guys. All the support goes a long, long way, whether you are supporting us over on Patreon or you're shouting us out on social media. You're liking and subscribing and following and rating all the places you can do so. It really means the world to us. It might not seem like a lot, but it really freaking helps. It does. I mean, with the way these algorithms work, a like is just another way to put us into someone else's feed. And you never know, we might get a new listener out of it. And that's pretty amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. Share the wealth. The wealth being us. <laughs> we are the wealth. Well, everybody, enjoy the rest of your weekend if you're listening to us here on Saturday at our lovely YouTube premiere. Hello. Welcome. Hi. I mean, we've already said hello in the chat, but hello again. Thank you. We appreciate you. 
Thank you all so much for listening. This has been The Grim Curriculum. Today, I have a cat fact for you. Wonderful. If you have spider plants in your home, you may find that your feline friends are drawn to them or even chew on them. And apparently this is because they have a similar effect to catnip. They're not toxic for cats, I will warn you guys, but they will get them a little buzzed. Good for them. Yeah. So if you have spider plants and a kitty in your house, maybe just watch out for the teeth marks. Bye. Bye.